Hello, my name is Michelle Royer, and I'm the Head of Community Services here at the Lucy Robbins Wells Library. Today, I have two very special visitors. We have Joan Kwasnichka, who is a reference librarian at our library, and we also have her daughter, Annie, who was on the front lines for COVID-19. I would like you to hear their story. Joan, take it away. Okay, well, thank you. It's lovely to be with everyone, and it'll be, I think, a very interesting discussion that, that Annie and I have. So Annie, how did you get into nursing? What's your background in this before we get to the COVID business? I graduated from UConn in 2006 with my nursing degree. I don't remember why I went into nursing, but I'm very glad that I did. Um, I did that and then I worked at St. Francis for two years on the cardiac unit. Um, after that, I moved down to Texas because um, that's where I grew up. So I came down here and I worked in the county hospital at the trauma hospital in the ICU for four years. And then I needed a little bit more of a challenge and something that maybe wasn't so hard on my back because um, moving ICU patients is a lot of work. So I went to CRNA school for three years down here. So I have my doctorate of nursing practice in anesthesia. So I'm a certified registered nurse anesthetist. Wow. And then I worked at the same hospital, at the county hospital for maybe four or five years. So I've been there for quite some time. Well, how did you end up in New York working at a COVID hospital after you worked in anesthesia in this county hospital? How did that come I, about? I left my permanent job, my full-time job doing anesthesia um, so that I could go and do travel assignments so I could go across the country and fill in places. Um, and that was just gonna give me more flexibility to travel really. Um, but then when COVID hit all of the elective surgeries across the country were canceled. So most of the anesthesia work was canceled. Um, once elective surgeries aren't going, we're not really needed as much. Right. Uh, because we mainly work in the operating room. There was still work to do in trauma units, um, in trauma hospitals because people still get in car um, and in labor and delivery. That was the other big thing. People are still having babies. So, um, so I was between assignments because COVID happened and I luckily got a call from an old um, anesthesiologist boss who was putting together a scout team of CRNAs to go to New York for COVID relief because our skills really translate to a lot of different areas so we can take care of critically ill patients. He asked quite a few people to go up there knowing that a lot of people would back out because of personal health concerns or because they have families to take care of and they didn't want to risk the exposure. Right. Um, my partner, Amanda, is also a CRNA and we don't have dependents. We don't live with elderly parents and we don't have kids. So we thought, sure, we'll go. This could be interesting. Um, <laughs> And New York really is everyone's city. So it was a no brainer to go and help out the people of New York. So once we made the decision, um, 18 hours later, three of us, three CRNAs were on a flight to New York. We headed into Manhattan. Um, we were kind of building the plane as we were flying it. We didn't, we knew where we were gonna stay. The company had put us into a hotel we didn't know how long we would be there. We didn't really know specifically what hospital we were going to. We didn't know how we were gonna get there, how we were gonna eat. We just showed up to a city that had completely shut down and was overwhelmed with COVID patients. Wow. So when we arrived, we um, got a call from one of the big academic centers and said, hey, I know that you were, were planning to go to the big hospital in Manhattan, but Brooklyn was hit really hard this weekend. And that's really the, it's the borough where it hit hardest and first. So at the end of March, um, you know, we landed in New York in the evening. We were asked to go to Brooklyn instead. So the next morning we got up at 4.30, got into a, um, a car from a car service and 
took the ride to Brooklyn. It was very eerie. We were staying in Times Square. Nobody was out. Um, there was no traffic. Nobody was driving. And we wow. just showed up to this hospital and we were greeted by these weary people with deep creases on their face from their masks and they were pale and tired and wide-eyed and just exhausted. Wow. Well, they must have been thrilled. Yeah, they didn't really know what to say. They, we <laughs> asked, where do you need us? And they said, everywhere. Oh. Patients just keep coming. It was like a tsunami that never ended. And this was when? The beginning of April? The end of March. End of March. March 30th. Yeah. Okay. So it was, things were really ginning up in New York at that point. They really were. Wow. Yeah. So what was it like in the hospital? Um, the hospital is a small community hospital. They have around 200 beds. They have the capacity right. for around 200 patients. Um, it's a community hospital. So they only had, they had a small ICU, 12 beds normally. They normally had maybe 10 patients on ventilators. Um, when we got there, there were 51 patients on ventilators. So wow. they were not all in the ICU. They were spread out all over the hospital. Um, you could hear monitors going off constantly, but no one could really address anything because everyone's, everyone was short of breath or everyone's machines were alarming. There were patients everywhere. It was like Tetris. Wow. Um, med surge nurses were taking care of ICU patients and they had no experience. They didn't know what they were doing. There were no monitors for patients. Wow. I'm just thinking about it. It was so loud in there. There were rapid responses being called every 20 minutes. And that's like when you need a crash card for someone, maybe they or don't someone found them and there's no pulse or their oxygen level is dangerously low or they're just not breathing or their blood pressure is too low or maybe they're having a stroke every 20 minutes i mean wow. maybe one a day right on a normal day right but this is every 20 minutes so you had your 12 bed icu but they and were, then what, they, in the hallways and five people in a room or? No, the ICU maintained one patient in each room, but there was spillover onto the regular floors. Right. We created another ICU, but it was staffed with not ICU nurses. Right. Um, so there was a lot of education to be done. There were patients that we would get called to as a rapid response and we would assess them and maybe do CPR and give them emergency medications, put breathing tubes in, put them on the ventilator um, and start them on drips to support their blood pressure and keep them calm. But then there was nowhere to move them to. Normally that kind of patient would get moved to the ICU, but there was nowhere to move them. So you have this patient who just crashed maybe in a room that's being shared with three or four other people, a nurse who's got 12 patients, and now they also have an ICU patient and they've never seen that before. Wow. Oh, well, sort of overwhelming for everyone concerned. It was, it was. Um, did it get better? It did get better. It did get better. A lot of the patients, um, were moved to the larger academic centers downtown. We would do right. that. We considered a patient to be viable. We right. thought that a patient really had a chance. Right. Um, so the younger patients, patients who are healthier, but weren't that many. Right. Um, the, the patients would come into the ER and if they could walk, and if they didn't require oxygen, we would encourage them to go home because there just wasn't room. Right. Patients who required oxygen, we would keep in the hospital. 
Um, and the, the way that we treated COVID patients changed every day. It evolved. And it wasn't based on research that was happening or what other hospitals were doing. It was based on directly what we were seeing, this pattern of, of the disease process going through. It was initially thought to be a respiratory disease, and that's why ventilators were such a big deal. Right. And then we started seeing these patients, when we would put them on the ventilator soon, kind of aggressively, they would all die. So now we're trying to use other sources of oxygen and keep them awake and breathing on their own. But then they were, we were also seeing blood clots. So patients are having strokes at a much higher rate than normal. Right. So now is it a clotting disease? Is that why this is all happening in the lungs? So all of this is changing right. every day. So you get these new providers in every day because the, the hospital system had reshuffled everybody. A right. plastic surgeon is now gonna work in the ER because no one's doing plastic surgery. But that's someone that we know can do things. So we, right. we reassign them temporarily. So while it may not have been your job role before, everyone in the community just came together and said, hey, I can do this. Will that right. help at all? Just tell me what to do. Right. You have a plastic surgeon now transporting patients from, from the ER to the ICU or to the floor. He's now a transporter. So <laughs> we're, we're learning all this stuff every day about the right. disease process, but also right. everyone is learning a new role. It was just a very, it's a very interesting environment to be in. Well, and, I, and nice that that was so eco. collaborative, that mm -hmm. people were not hung up on, well, this is my job, this is all I do, I'm not, uh, I'm sorry, I'm not doing that. Yeah, there was, there was none, none of that. I heard every day, I'm not an ICU nurse. And every day I would say, but today you are. And I'm gonna help you with that. Right. We're now an ICU nurse, let's do this. Right. It was Here's how to do it. education and assistance right. and just being a resource and learning about the disease process. And an extra hand. And an extra hand. Yeah, wow. So. Yeah. You were working two days on, one day off. Yes, we did that for what, Sandy. What did you do when you weren't there at the hospital? Um, we talked to a lot of people who at home wanted to know how to treat these patients and how to get ready. Right. And so we normally had a conference call with people at our old hospital, um, or we talked to people in other states, other colleagues, about how to treat these patients. Um, and how we were protecting ourselves with our PPE. And then we would take some of the city bikes, the, you know, the, the shared bike service in New York, and we put on a mask, put some Purell and Lysol wipes into our pocket, and we would go bike around. We, we were spending two days with with two masks on, goggles, a face shield, a gown, and gloves, and not taking any of it off for 12 hours and staying inside. So when we were off, we just we always just wanted to be in the fresh air. Right. See something green. It was spring. We needed something positive and hopeful. You found all the 9-11 daffodils. We found all the 9-11 <laughs> daffodils. <laughs> We found all the small gardens and through uh, Central Park and got a yeah. little bit of exercise. And reminded yourself that, you know, spring is coming and things are regenerating. Yeah. And there's more to life than COVID and hospitals and dying. Yeah. I, you know, it's, you get so, you get to where you're just swimming in it. You, we were swimming in COVID literally and figuratively. And we needed right. something to remind us that that wasn't everything. We couldn't turn on the TV. We couldn't look at our phones. We couldn't oh, talk God. to anybody without COVID, COVID, COVID. Right, right. Everything was COVID. Every patient had COVID. But you both were tested for COVID, right? 
Um, Amanda wasn't, I was tested for the antibodies and I was negative. So I feel very secure in my PPE. Right. Okay. Um, and that was never something that we had to worry about because our hospital was part of a large academic center. We had right. resources that smaller hospitals didn't have. Right. Well, that was fortunate. It was, it was a big stuff. relief for me too. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, I like to support you, but I got really nervous, yeah. especially when you would talk about how things were going. So I was thrilled that you had PPE. Yeah. Just tickled yeah. silly. It must be um, hearing for me that every single person that I touched died. And then I yeah. could have gotten that disease. Yeah. Hmm. But you got the worst of the worst in the ICU, right? Yeah. Yeah. So some people, I mean, I just kept thinking, there must have been some people who survived. I mean, they can't all die. Um, but they probably weren't in your ICU. And I'm the No. Yeah. No. The, the thing with this disease that we can't figure out is it, it doesn't really care who you are or how you get it. Once it's in your body, it's going to do whatever it's going to do. And right. there's nothing you can do to lessen it. Right. or predict how it's going to how it's going to attack your body right cuz it could be strokes it could be clots yeah okay so did you find that you had any kind of what what was the effect of working on covid on you guys physically you are just exhausted you peaked mentally Emotionally, I mean, how did that work for you? Did you notice a difference when you returned to Texas? So when I was up there, we, we learned these coping mechanisms when we worked in the ICU, whether we wanted to or not. They were right. That's right. how we survived. We, we have this way of compartmentalizing. Right. So we care for the patients very much and we do our best, but there's some barrier that we don't let these patients get behind. And that's right. something that we reserve for our own family and friends. Right. It is much easier when you never meet the patient. When the first time you see them, you're putting a breathing tube in them or, or you're doing CPR. It's actually much easier because you've never had a conversation with them. Right. The patients that we followed all the way through to finding out when their funeral was and their GoFundMe page for their family after they died, those are the patients that we talked with before. And we tried so hard to keep them off the ventilator and keep them from dying to no avail. Right. I mean, it just so you found never to be successful. You found that once they were in the ICU on ventilators, it was almost it's over. The of the end. Yeah. So one of the things that we tried to do when we got there was um, to have conversations with the providers who would call families and right. have them explain exactly what's actually happening and maybe get um, some DNR orders so that we wouldn't be forced DNR. to CPR. Uh, DNR orders do not resuscitate. So okay. if the heart stops, we don't do CPR. Right. I did a lot of CPR. I mean, I would do it maybe four or five times a day. You end up cracking ribs. I'm doing CPR on patients who are 95, 96 years old. And I know that it's futile. But because usually they have other, other um, problems, medical issues. It's not just COVID that they come in with. At 95, are you 100% healthy? Um, you don't heal as quickly, but many of them didn't really have other diagnoses. Oh, well. So... There's a lot of talk about patients having, being already being sick or being of a certain demographic. 
And I can only speak to my hospital, but the demographics of the patients with COVID were representative of the demographics of the hospital before of the community. Right. So if, the, if we serve normally like 40 to 90 year olds, right. in normal times, it's the same population we're getting with COVID. Right. So I don't know what to say about that. There's well, so much we still don't know. And we don't talk about death. We don't talk about end of life issues. No, there's, I think there's a lot of sh shame or regret and guilt in allowing a patient to die. Well, it's, it's, it's merciful. It's giving up for some people. Yes. And but your body is already decided. Right. It's, it's not that you mentally decided to give up. It's that your body said, okay, I, I can't do this anymore. Right. And instead of putting a patient through painful resuscitative efforts, I, I think we should just have a little bit more mercy and have those conversations before we get to this point. It's very hard to have those conversations with family over the phone when they're not allowed in the hospital. Right. They don't see how uncomfortable someone is, is just existing 24 seven. Right. They have the, the image of them when they were healthy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. So yeah. the hospital um, started using a lot of um, iPads and setting them up and doing Zoom meetings. Right. And that helped quite a bit, you know, so families could talk to them, but they couldn't talk back. So they right. couldn't say their piece. And hopefully here. Yeah. yeah. So Annie, what did you learn? And would you do this again? I would absolutely do it again. That community is incredible. We worked with the respiratory therapists um, of whom many were sick, they weren't working. A lot of the staff wasn't working. I think they were out maybe a third. Wow. You know, because they were treating patients who didn't have COVID. Oh, right. But they did. They just yeah. hadn't been tested. So the staff wasn't wearing PPE. So we really helped in that, in that regard, just to be extra hands but the staff and the community there they just reshuffled to to do what was necessary and they kept coming to work and i would absolutely without any hesitation go and help a community like that again right i learned how much people really pull together and help each other out when they don't even have time to think. It's just an automatic response. Is right. to keep showing up and supporting each other. Right. I learned a lot of technical stuff about very sophisticated ventilators, <laughs> respiratory therapists who are incredible. Yeah. Okay. I'm still trying to uh, reconcile everything that I saw. Right. Well, it's a lot to process. Yeah. In a short amount of time. And I think yeah. you have to decompress and it takes a while. It's been hard coming back to Texas and seeing that our numbers are going up, but because no one, no one saw it. Right. It didn't seriously. exist. Seriously. Yeah. So yeah. that's been pretty frustrating. Well, as long as you go out with masks. I'll protect myself and those around me. Yeah, good. good. The little community that we've built for ourselves here, they trust us. <laughs> they believe oh, what we saw, so they, they trust what we suggest. Yeah, because you so guys are not really Yeah. Good. Not making well, it. thank you. Thank you very much. This was, I think, very informative for me, even though I know some of it. You do. So, I, it was and good I for like it. 
I'd like to thank you both for doing this for us. And I know, um, you know, just working with your mom every day and, you know, texting back and forth what's going on. I know how hard it was for her and how hard it was for you, but what a wonderful, beautiful thing. Everyone is so thankful for what you've done. And, um, you know, you being in New York helps us know that our families are protected here in Connecticut. It just, it just goes such a long way. I just can't thank you both enough for sharing with us today. Thank you. Well, thank you. All I was right. happy to do it because I didn't I'm have to work in the hospital. All right. All right. Well, thank you. And <laughs> I think we'll end it and say goodbye. Thank you. Okay. Have a great day. Okay. Bye. Bye.